Welcome to the Angel Rewatch, a spoiler-free retrospective podcast on Angel. I'm William. And I'm Derek, and this is a podcast for Through the Looking Glass, originally airing May 15th, 2001, writ by Tim Minear. Cordelia jokes with the guys because having swords to your necks is hilarious, but then lets them live. And then there's a bunch of opening exhibition stuff while everyone gets worried in, but let's give you the benefit of the doubt and say you have enough long-term memory that you remember what happened last week. Oh, and there are jokes about Angel's hair. This is a very funny episode, but this joke is not. Anyway, Lauren and Angel go to visit Lauren's family, who include a beard mom and a dancing Joss Whedon in makeup. Thanks to Land Doc and Angel's slaying of the Droken, though, they see Angel as more than your average cow. They anoint him as a hero and want to hear his tales of vanquishing the evil lawyer beast. Cordelia finds out that part of her duty as a princess is made with a disgusting Grizzly log. This, in addition to Wesley finding out that the Covenant is this dimension's Wolfram Hart, convinces them that they need to escape the castle. Wesley and Gunn exit through the sewers, but Cordelia is discovered and forced to stay. Angel's hero duties are regulated to him telling stories about how awesome he is, though. He has to ask you to cow the same girl who tried to save Cordelia. Unable to do it, he refuses and begins to fight off the crap. Lauren starts to sing, and the Pylians collapse in agony, allowing Angel and the girl to escape. Angel takes her back to her cave home and discovers she is none of the girl from Corey's vision and belonging, Fred. Fred, having to fend completely for herself in this strange dimension, is a bit odd, which is to say, completely adorable. Cordelia meets the Grizzly Lug, and he's a total babe. A total babe that looks, sounds, and acts eerily similar to Angel, and I'm just going to leave that there. Anyway, Cordelia is immediately attracted to him, and it's a mutual attraction. Suddenly, come shucking doesn't look so bad. Fred and Angel are attacked by the palace guards, and Angel fights back, except he doesn't go into vampire mode. He completely transforms into a demon, and savagely kills one of the pilots. Wesley and Gunn are lost in the woods, and the demon angel attacks them. Angel leaps on Gunn and rips into him, but Fred shows up. Somehow she knows that Blood will be enough to lure Angel away, and he runs after her. Wesley then gives us the explanation of why Angel looks the way he does. For some reason in Pylea, Angel can't control himself as he does in on Earth, and that's the true demon inside of him. Really, it's just because that's a more interesting story. Speaking of story manipulations, Wesley and Gunner are then cra- captured by the human rebels we've heard about so much throughout the episode. Fred gets Demon Angel to look at his fraction in the pond. He might be a savage beast, but the demon inside Angel is still a big Mulan fan, and this makes it work, and Angel transforms back to normal. He's traumatized by experience, though, and begins to shake in Caesar. Fred tries to comfort him. Wesley and Gunn convince the rebels that they are friends with the princess and that they can help them. The rebels will leave there telling the truth about their friendship with Cordelia. Unfortunately, that just means they'll be a great way to send in a message and decide to cut off their heads and send them to her. That's not the only cliffhanger of the episode. The Grooslug convinces Cordelia that she could really be a great ruler here, and she decides to make some proclamations. The coven is not too happy about the women folk having all these ideas, so Silas, the head of the group, goes to Cordelia and tells her she's been partying too many people. So he opens up the platter to reveal Lauren's head on it. And that's the end of the episode. Little John Robin Hood walking through why? the forest. Why? 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 <laughs> why? I want you to tell everyone why you hate fun and you don't like this episode. I don't hate fun, and I like this episode. Okay. Uh, you fe- uh, you you kind of like it. No, I, I okay. So the start of the episode was a little uh, awkward to get into. I wasn't one hundred percent on board. Uh, and yes, but then immediately we get Numfar doing the dance of joy. I know, and that's immediately when I started liking the episode. Okay, <laughs> basically I, was, I just had to get over myself. Like this, someone arc, sounds like they were crabby when they sat down to watch this. I don't think necessarily crabby. I think. I had different expectations. I didn't necessarily remember this arc on rewatch. Colin was being a grump. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, this season, you know, we, we had the very, it's been very dark and very serious. And this last arc has been really fun and really goofy. And just accepting that I, you know, finally started to enjoy myself. I would say it's fun and goofy. And then it, Switches to being very serious if we're in a cave with Fred and Angel. Yeah, I and mean, it's still maybe with Cordelia. But yeah, it's still it's still a Whedon verse thing. So they do play on your expectations. Like that's 
what they've been doing the entire time here? Well, I think they've been trying to do that. I don't think Over the Rainbow was did a good job at balancing the two. Right. It hasn't been 100% successful, okay. but... Here's how I feel about it. Oh, well, here's how I feel about Over the Rainbow. I feel like Over the Rainbow tried to put manipulated characters into wacky situations and then was trying to undercut the attention of whatever's going on with Cordelia. Where here, obviously, it's still being written, but I feel that the dangerous situations, and they they undercut the tension better because it feels more natural and organic. Like, for example, the fact that Fred is severely mentally traumatized. So that's pretty dark. And yet she is still incredibly funny at times. Right. I don't think this episode is 100% natural. Like, there's some storylines that still feel very... Like, you can feel the writer's fingerprints on them. What, uh, would you, what do you feel? Specifically, like, the direction that Wesley and Gunn are going. Well, I don't know what Wesley and Gunn are doing in this episode, to be honest, because they don't do a whole lot. Although, right, but, honestly, let's be, let's be real. <laughs> Wesley is probably going to lead the Rebels. Yeah, I mean, it, it feels like that's the direction it's... Wesley and Gunn are the only thing towards. that I would say are bad in this episode. Well, I, I'm not saying anything's bad. I'm just well, saying... Well, I think I am. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that's the one thing I don't like in this episode, is Wesley and Gunn. <laughs> uh, see, I don't dislike their, them. No, I... See, uh, the thing okay, is, I, maybe I don't dislike I don't... In they're the weakest part of the episode. Yeah. I do not like it. Because I feel... As if they're not doing a whole lot. I think they're setting up pretty obviously that Wesley is going. They're not going to cut off. They're not going to cut off everybody's heads, but <laughs> Angel, Fred, and Cordelia. I mean, that's just not going to happen. So I'm, I, I feel pretty confident since we started this off about Wesley having confidence issues about a leader. I think he's going to become the leader of the rebels. So that's what he's going to do. But he doesn't right. do a whole lot this episode, and Gunn does nothing but react to things in very funny ways, which is, I guess, a valuable skill, but I would like the character to do something other than be reactionary. Right, but mostly they 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 don't do a whole lot in this episode. Wesley does a lot of Wesley gets exposition. to shuffle some books around. Right. Which um, was very cool, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, that I had remembered this part, but it was it was cool and gave us more insight that the Covenant... Well, I mean, they're already really spelled out to be bad guys. <laughs> yes, yeah, the they're, the they're hoods. black hoods and their secret <laughs> meetings about things where they talk vaguely. I think it but, was pretty safe to say they were evil. But tying them to Wolfram and Hart is, is really cool. Yeah. Well, um, I guess, well, tying them to the overall idea that evil is universal. And I guess, I mean, I don't know if there's actual links between the Wolfram and Hart that we know... And the Covenant. Right. We we don't know how direct their connection is, but we do know that Wolfram and Hart like, exist in other dimensions based off of the fact that the senior partners come from another dimension. Not saying that they come from this dimension, but it was intriguing, which is nice. Like, sets up for more questions of, like, what's going on and makes the Covenant actually seem more... Well, it makes the Covenant seem more than just evil people in Pylea. Right. One-off villains that they need to take care of. It can give them a little more threat to them. Wesley did... Uh, like, Wesley does come across more of a leader, or maybe he just tries to take charge of the whole situation well, Wesley, whenever... I think... Doesn't he designate where everybody's going to go in that clunky opening scene? Yeah, he designates where everyone's going to go uh, in that opening scene. Uh, when the Covenant comes in to talk to... Cordelia about the Grusalog and the Kamshuk, he kind of, not tricks them, but kind of, yeah, he kind of manipulates them into uh, telling them more about it. Mm-hmm. Well, he pick, uh, he picks up first how to manipulate them, and then every gun and Cordelia follow suit. Right. And then he, he has the plan of escaping. Granted, that doesn't fall through completely. Well, it falls through for them. <laughs> right, Cordelia and all her booty. Not that booty. That booty. Okay, uh, yeah, it's guns lines are very funny. I just 
I would still like him to be an ally fighting Wolfram Hart and actually doing something, because I don't see what essential role he's performing here besides someone that Wesley can explain things to. So Wesley's just not in the woods turning to the camera, explaining to us <laughs> why Angel is all green and horny. Literal horns. Yes. I mean, there's um, a lot of double on Dodger. Cumshuck is not a subtle, subtle. name. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it would be better if... I mean, Gunn did have a lot of clever lines. I really loved uh, him continually telling Wesley to shut up when they were, got captured by the Rebels. Mm-hmm. And then and then he comments on, like, why did I come here? To comment and not- quickly, because I, I think we should probably move on from Wesley Gunn. I do... The one thing I like, and not because I think it's good, I just think it's weird, where Wesley just takes the mud and Gunn doesn't... Gunn is freaked out by that for a reason, reasonably, and Wesley's like, it's fine. Wesley doesn't know anything about the actual physiology of this world. We know that the sunlight doesn't bother Angel, but this mud, it's going to be okay. It won't infect you. Yeah, mud in the water, you know, stagnant, you know. No, 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 you're good. You're good. Because I said it, because I read, I read books, and that means when I say something's right, it obviously is. We know nothing about this dimension. Yeah, that, that was... Weird. I just kind of like tried to force myself to ignore that. <laughs> I don't even know why. Like, I don't even know why you need to address that. God, d- d- he doesn't need mud. He, maybe just say it's a shallow cut. Fine, move on. Because that was just hilarious to me. That, that you know, the mud's fine. Don't worry about it. Well, I don't think they should do a shallow cut because we did see uh, Angel rip that other guy's arm off. Oh, well. So if 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 Gun comes out of that unscathed, okay, so it has a little, little bit of scarring. Whatever. <laughs> it is very strategically placed logo on his shirt. Right. Mm-hmm. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, so let's just move on from them because I feel like we've wasted. Them. <laughs> we've talked more about them than they were <laughs> actually in the episode. Uh, that, that is probably true. So I liked Angel in this episode and having. Lorne and have the duty of kind of like explaining what Angel's thought process was going on in the episode. I liked, I still found the hair, the hair thing. Okay. Like, um, it makes no sense to me because Angel, <laughs> there's no way that if, that just naturally occurs. Angel right, has so he has to, his hair. I'm sorry. So he never gets to see what his hair looks like when he's done, but he it, has right? to be doing it. He's like surprised. It's even sticking up. Yeah. Okay. He asked us, i always <laughs> like this. How do you not know? Well, maybe it wasn't necessarily the fact that it was sticking up. Maybe it was just the oh, way it was trying to explain it. It's a dumb joke. <laughs> it's a dumb joke. I still like it. Sense. I still like that. I just didn't. Okay. Well, it, it I wasn't like funny. Ha ha. And I we haven't talked it. about Numfar in depth. And I would really like to devote the next hour to talk about Numfar. Well, I, yeah, that was one of the funniest scenes in the episode. Well, I really liked uh, when his mom starts talking to him and then angel you know, or- mom. <laughs> yes. Okay. There's two angel reaction shots that are real. It's that. And then when Numfar starts doing the dance of joy, angel, and I'm not sure if it's angel or it's David Boreanaz, he goes behind Lauren and I'm not sure if he's breaking in that moment or he's just <laughs> enjoying the dance so much. And the thing is, that when they would film that, they would have to, they would have to just film their side of the conversation. So it could be that Numfar is doing an even more ridiculous dance for them to react to. <laughs> His dance was already really ridiculous. <laughs> and what I love about the dance of joy and honor is it happens completely in the background, and it really has no effect on the conversation that's going on. It's just running. It never becomes the focus of the scene, except it's all I can watch. Right. It's just there for a sight gag, but it's a really funny one, and it works really well. And the fact that it's Joss Whedon. It works well nice. when it, you don't even know that's Joss Whedon makeup. Right. It's just nice trivia. And, uh, and on the wiki, I read that they did it. Um, well, Lauren didn't know, and Hallett didn't know, and I'm not sure if they were... But the actors didn't know that was him in makeup. He did it in another trailer, so they wouldn't know it was him. <laughs> and they only found it out later. And Andy Hallett thought that the dancer was terrible. 
I mean, it is terrible, but it's really, really funny. Well, yeah, I, I, anyhow, having a musical theater background. And the other thing is, there's, it's, I, I think it's a, it's not a widely accepted known fact that Joss Whedon actually really likes to dance. He just likes to do it all the time at like parties and things. If you listen to as much Joss Whedon people interviews as I do, that's something yeah. that comes up. He, he likes to dance, and I think he dances like that just for fun. The nerdy white guy dancing. Uh-huh. All right. So we can move on from them for our guests, if that's something you want to do. <laughs> so then we have Angel just being really proud of himself with all his tales. Well, there's, of- a, there's, there's three meta jokes that I really like in this episode. One is Angel talking about Lindsay. I feel like the meta jokes in here are crafted specifically for us. Because there's a joke about Lindsay being the evil Laura Beast. There's the one where uh, Landock wants to hear the story from I Fall to Pieces. And Lauren has a very sarcastic <laughs> reaction of, oh, that's, that's a good, a good one. one. And then Cordelia talking about she would like to find a dimension where a demon doesn't want to impregnate her with her spawn. Right. That was the, like, what, am I supposed to be okay with them? Uh, well, I will get into I mean, Cordelia. Yeah. But right now I want to stick with Angel. But I just talking about meta jokes that I really enjoy. Those are. Yeah. Uh, I like the host, or Lorne. Uh, you can call him the host. They're still calling him the host. Right. I liked the him telling Angel, when other people start seeing you that way, you start to see it yourself kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And, and talking about how you don't... You can ignore all the gray moral uh, issues with uh, your stories here. Mm-hmm. That was a nice reflection on the character, which the uh, the host is really good at every time. So it's been a while since he's given his kind of wisdom talking to the gang since we've been here. But really, I just want to talk about Fred. I don't, Fred I don't and know Angel why we've wasted all this time, and we haven't talked about Fred. So yeah, so we finally make the. They finally comment in the episode that it is the same girl from the vision. Mm-hmm. I found the scene where Angel turns into the full on. Oh wait, you want to get to that uh, first because I want to talk about the first cave scene. I don't want. To. Yeah, okay, sure. Let's talk yeah, about the can... first cave scene because all right, here's the deal. I have a real sensitivity for characters who have a mental disability or some kind of mental trauma that um, affects their personality in some way. It just gets to me. It doesn't even have to be good, well done, to be honest. I'll cry at I am Sam. I don't care. But she is so good at being, the, acting out how, what living in Pylea has done her. Because obviously, before she got sucked into the portal, I don't think she knew what demons were, let alone that she's in a, she's in a dimension now where she doesn't know anyone that, and she's a slave. It's right. a quite different scenario from Cordelia who knew what was going on before she got sucked into the portal and she's had to fend for herself and she she kind of has this own mini resistance from what we're getting when they go to execute her that she's been living for five years coming in and stealing well she escaped from being a slave I guess to begin with since she has the collar and then has been stealing food ever since right she has appeared in her very brief things as a I come across uh, at least smart, or at least how everyone else has commented on her. Like they had the um, constable calling her clever. Mm-hmm. Uh, the fact that she was able to disable that caller. We know that she was a physicist. We're studying um, to be one. Yeah, but yeah, I I really did like her psyche is really fractured. They they give her some really nice lines. Like yes, yeah, she comes like her story is pretty serious for the most part or the most serious of the episode, but they still even give her like the funny line about how they made Cordelia princess. <laughs> they didn't uh, do that. Oh, they didn't do that for me. Uh, good for her. <laughs> yeah. But that's the other thing too. And she's able to be so funny and it, the joke is never on. She's able to be funny because of the way she responds to things, but the joke isn't on that. She's weird. And we should laugh at that. Like the Big Bang Theory, for instance, where the joke is Sheldon has a mental disability, so let's all point and laugh at him. 
Because he has autism, right. but he doesn't really have autism because they could say he was tested for it, so they cop out of that. Whatever. That's my rant over for now. <laughs> well, Angel comes across as trying to treat her really uh, delicately. Well, um, the, the other thing I want to talk about is Angel comes off as very sweet, and we've seen Angel interact very differently with children. Or very in the same in a similar way to children, and I feel that's the way he's treating her. Not to say that he, not that she is a child, but that's the way he seems to understand that she's in a delicate situation. Right. I mean, we've seen him treat children that way. We've also seen him treat damsels that way. I'm not I'm calling. Wouldn't. I'm not calling her that. Well, I'm but not saying I don't think pretty girls. <laughs> I I wouldn't go that far. I think he's treating Fred in a different way than he's treated many damsels, mostly because I don't remember them, so maybe. (laughs) Yeah, Fred does come across as memorable. And the other thing is that she... The inner strength that she's had to have to deal with what's going on makes her in no... Even though... If Fred was some kind of badass... If Fred was the leader of... Actually, that might be cool. Never mind, I lied. I was going to say, if Fred is the leader of the, the revolution, she's some kind of badass. She she looks like she weighs about 70 pounds, and I don't know how tall she is, so that might be <laughs> unbelievable, but then again, that might be kind of awesome. But the same thing is that I don't think you could possibly call her weak. The fact that she's able to been able to have survived... By herself for five years, for the most part. That's why I like oh. when she brings up the blood and the Braveheart music. Does but you don't because you don't like fun. Well, one that seems about to be fun, but two, it's just really over the top and pretty cheesy. Um, I, you I think just maybe don't like fun. Music and wasn't you don't selling like it for things. me. Well, music can just be really. I'm really sensitive to it, so. I have so, to how like, do you feel about her Texas accent? Because you've talked off podcast about how you think Fred has a very thick Texas accent when she first shows up. It is so really present, but. Uh, it like comes in and out actually, like it's it's very clear that she's doing an accent. I don't think it's necessarily bad, but it is kind of thick at times. I but she has to be grumpy. She does. <laughs> they don't have her talk that much. I mean, she talks, but but she talks an incredible amount. She has the whole Most conversation time by it's, herself. <laughs> right. What I'm saying is the accent comes in and goes, but it I'm, I don't want to focus on the the accent okay. because I do think she is the strength of the episode. Yes, like her storyline is very very well done. I like the moment when Angel turns into the full on Nosferatu uh, demon, full vampire I thing. Nosferatu. I don't know what that is. It looks. I feel like that's a pretty. I don't. I like that as an idea. I think that's a pretty lazy demon design. That I think they just had green makeup hanging around from the Pileans. Well, besides the greenness, I think it actually works pretty well. Like the the way his claws are extended on his finger. I like that. I'm just uh, and I, then his teeth. I think very horny, mm-hmm. literal horns. Uh, I, the green I could do without, but that's fine. I I still think it is pretty effective. It's kind of weird because he's still. You know, dressed in the same clothes, but I don't know. It works. Well, um, it rips just enough so we can see the tattoo. Right. Or, I think Wesley <laughs> can. Yeah. I think it's more effective than some of the other demon makeup we've gotten in the past. Well, I like I this a lot. Stepped up their demon makeup game in general. I like that it's Angel in the the makeup, especially. I mean, later when we get back to the cave, we'll we'll talk about that, but. Like him seeing his reflection, you can definitely tell it is uh, David Boreanaz in the in the makeup. Because oh, I couldn't. Um, <laughs> if you could, that's I really couldn't tell if it was him until I even when he morphed, I I didn't immediately because I'm not getting a whole I'm not getting a whole lot of reaction or facial expressions in that makeup because the makeup doesn't really move. It's pretty. I mean, you can see his eyes. But I'm not getting... I didn't immediately get that it was him. It could be. And if you did, fine. I just didn't get that from him. From him. Well, at the same time, I think... I mean, they're doing a good job with the makeup. I oh, know. I think so, it's, it looks good. I'm just saying I didn't know it was him. It could have been anybody. Because it was so <laughs> unrecognizable. I don't... 
So I don't want to talk about him until we get to the that scene, and I think we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> so, being okay. very unsubtle, can we move over to Cordelia? <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, okay. we can. So, the, okay. So the beginning's really strange. I know it's supposed strange. to be really, really funny, but it it, it comes across <laughs> really weird. Okay, so. I think it's in character for her. I'm actually, I think it's in character, and I think it was a lot of fun how much she's enjoying being a princess. Um, when she plays with them, that she might, you know, just let them die. I that's so bizarre to me, right? And so different for like I could understand if Cordelia was angry at them for some reason, she could tease them like that. But she shouldn't be. I don't know why she would be. And it's just, well, they could have. Uh, yeah, it's just this really weird joke that it stretches out too long. <laughs> where they have, she doesn't. She almost say that you can kill them, and if they don't hold the swords up to their necks and just wait, they could. Someone's head could have gotten chopped off just then, and then her funny little joke turns into a very big mess. Right. She says, "Off with their heads." Yes. And just kidding. It it was a really it it was weird. It was weird. And then uh, if from that, it's just exposition Orama with everyone recapping what happened last episode and Lauren suddenly knowing this whole prophecy when Angel literally asked him why they would want Cordelia and he has no idea. Yeah, it's convenient. More uh, writer's fingerprints on it. If they would have get, given Cordelia... Like, what took you guys so long? All I needed was that line, and it would help explain away the beginning of her messing with them. Mm-hmm. But they don't do that. No. And it's, so it's just really strange. Her her enjoying being princess is funny. It comes across it comes across a little shallow, but that's, you know, Cordelia can do that. Well, here's and then what I like. I don't know if it comes so much as shallow as that Cordelia's had a really rough year in L.A., and she... I don't know if she sees it as a reward or she's do this, but why can't... I have no problem with her being happy about being worshipped as a princess. Right. Well, it comes. It becomes a lot more clear later in the episode, which I like. With uh, it, when she's talking to, Gr- to Grusalog and yeah. like her entire self-esteem is kind of shot, mm-hmm. which, I mean, it's understandable why. Mm-hmm. And I really do love that scene because the Grusalog basically uh, talks her up kind of like the audience would, you know what I mean? Like these are, see, here's, here are some of the qualities that we really love about Cordelia. Grusalog looks like Angel, yes or no? Um, he looks kind of like Angel and the, I can't believe it's not butter guy had a baby and gave him you blue contacts. Fabio? Yes. <laughs> okay. He's very Fabio. It's very uh, romance novel cover yeah. guy. Which I actually really like how, um, I'm going to use the word thirsty, Cordelia is <laughs> for the Grusalog. Because I mean, you rarely kind of see female sexual attraction for a guy in that way on TV. Right. And yeah, I like that. And let's it be honest, funny. she kind of needs it. Because the last time she comes shot, she got impregnated. That we know of. With a demon baby. With a demon baby. God. Uh, so do you so, want to talk about if we're supposed to find that joke funny? I mean, probably not. I'm glad. It's just another meta joke. See, I think it's funny um, if... I, I find I, it funny and I appreciate it if it's the last time they go back to this well. Right. I think I find it funny in the same way that they commented on the doctor. Well, they really should have talked about Lonely Hearts. Just separate. <laughs> I mean, if you're going to pick an episode for season one, Lonely Hearts, I mean, that would be the one I would crap on. I don't know. The eyeball guys was pretty was a pretty bad episode. I don't know. Like, I comment- good. I'm just saying uh, there's worse ones to pick one. Like, commenting on it in the same way, in the same kind of tone, saying, like, hey, this was probably a mistake kind of thing. Yeah, that's what I like. If the fact that they're recognizing that it's a mistake in that joke, I like. 
And it just Charisma Carpenter's comedic timing, I think you could sell any joke to me. And I find it funny. Right. Well, for some reason I found this worked better than some of the jokes uh, last week's. But maybe it's because the story is more interesting. I think the writing is better. I think what I'm saying is that I feel that it comes off more organic. I think it's the Joss Whedon tone. It's not like anybody else does comedy and drama in the same way or supernatural or whatever or horror it's the fact that he what happens on his specific type of shows is that people react to the ridiculousness that is going on around them and comment on them in witty ways and i feel like in over the rainbow they put them purposely in these situations wacky things where they could comment on i think it's the difference so i think it's the difference between When it's good, it's like this. When it's not, it's like Over the Rainbow, or it's like an early episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which very much tried to be like that, and it was undercutting itself all the time and not really understanding why. The jokes aren't funny because you're undercutting them. It's because you have to. The tension needs to be there to make fun of the tension. And the story needs to be interesting to make the jokes about the story. Right. And at the same time, I like that... They also do what Whedon shows do, which is they can immediately flip it on a dime and have this goofy and fun episode get quite serious. Mm-hmm. Like there, there's a there's a nice way. Like like they they balance really well. Um, they can change comedic moments into serious moments, but it still works. Whereas last week felt a little like the balance just wasn't quite there. But like you said, like the writing here is just more clever. Because it goes like Fred. If you think about why Fred is acting the way that she is, it's a horrifying situation. But also the things she says are funny. And that's what works about it because it works on both levels. That You can look at what she's saying and think it's kind of horrifying because she's been in this terrible situation for five years. So that's the way she's acting. But when you look at what she is actually saying and how she responds to things, that's a humorous response. Right. Um, and when you think about Cordelia getting pregnant by a demon, that's terrifying, but the way that Cordelia talks about it is funny. I can't think of an actual example to compare it to Over the Rainbow because I don't remember that episode. Because <laughs> it wasn't as good. It gets kind of dark uh, by the end of the episode when the Covenant. Well, I think is that's appropriate all... because I think we're leading into the finale of this arc where right. things need to get serious. The end of this is the first time I've actually felt that Pylea is any kind of real threat. I mean, right. Lorne's head like is chopped off. Right. I doubt Lorne off screen, but his head is chopped off. <laughs> the, he, the other thing about... Oh, hold on. The other thing about yeah. killing Lorne is why I seriously doubt that they killed him off screen. He is at the level of character where they could kill him off off screen, and I would believe it. I don't, but I could. Like, if that was... If it was Wesley's head... I'm probably not going to believe that. Like if they, if we say, if we have the scene where they, the rebels say we're going to cut off their heads and send them, and then the next time we see their severed heads, I'm probably not going to believe they're going to give Wesley and Gunn a death screen, death scene off screen. But Lauren is at the level where I could buy that. Right. Yeah, I, I could see that too. I like Joss Whedon always has this thing where he wanted to like play up a character and, and kill them off, kind of like uh, Jesse in the, the first episode of Buffy. you mean Doyle from nine episodes of this show? Uh, yeah, that too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so it, oh, it you just could, forgot about I mean, Doyle, did you? I did forget about Doyle. <laughs> uh, it could be something like that, and it was pretty shocking. I can't remember my exact reaction the first time I saw this. Mm-hmm. You probably um, just went and watched the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> probably. <laughs> But kind of getting back to Cordelia. But we haven't really talked about Gru at all, besides the fact that I think he looks like Angel. Right, that's true. Um, I his his character is very over the top, but that's it works. Well, I don't uh, think the, he has much of a character, to be honest. Right. I think he's a piece he's of just ass. this. <laughs> he's this handsome hunk he's a, guy. He's a about goofy piece his... of ass that Cordelia wants to have sex with him. Why not? Because he's willing, she's willing, and he's very pretty. 
Right, and he comes across pretty, pretty sweet. Yeah, and his his talking up of Cordelia and saying saying that she is a princess and everything. Which I'm not sure why why he thinks she's so beautiful because he seems to think that he's repulsive, and they're both uh, on the same standard of beauty. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, the fact that she is human. Yes, and, and he thinks, and he comes from a world where humans are disgusting. So while I but, like the scene where he, where I like, I like her reaction when she gets to talk about that. Really, she's back in a in her where she's from. She's nothing special. I like her side of it. I just I don't understand why, from what we know of him, that he's so in, suddenly enraptured by her. Because it's Charisma Carpenter. Okay, I understand why <laughs> a normal person was, but Gru is not. Gru has right. been raised to uh, think that the bold, the weird lumps in his arms are disgusting and not muscles. And his the fact that he can smile is odd. Well, the fact that uh, if she is... He calls her transcendent or she's like fulfilling some prophecy, mm-hmm. then maybe he just... Like, she's beyond being human. Well, I guess that's the way the Pileans see her, too. Right. So, yeah, the only ones that comment negatively on her are the Covenant. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I I still think it works. I didn't necessarily go down that rabbit hole. But, man, I just liked him talking her up as as she's kind of, like, down on herself. Mm -hmm. So that she kind of gets her confidence boost back. Stella got her groove back. And I really feel like she probably should be doing nice things because she has these two slave girls that are surrounding her at all times. Yeah, that's a little odd. <laughs> yeah, that we're not just commenting about how they feed her grapes and she seems pretty happy about that. <laughs> well, she does get, she's going to make proclamations. Mm-hmm. Stop slavery and uh, no polyester, so... Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about that? The only thing I would want to say is that um, when she first meets Gru, I really like her reactions. And just talking about Chris McCarver's comedic timing. Right. Like, she could have just gone hubba da hubba da hubba da at some well, point. Well, she, she pretty <laughs> much does go hubba da hubba da hubba da. Uh, but she sells it in such a way that... I mean, it's it's pretty over the top and cheesy, but she sells it in a way that's very entertaining. Right. Like I like the the kill me now with the luggage beast or whatever, mm-hmm. and then him coming in. It, it worked pretty worked pretty well. Um, <laughs> I like. I forget what Gru says, and I just like Cordelia. Cordelia doesn't know what he says. He'll like, well, and then huh? Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> then when he, she gets to touch him, and she is very happy about it. <laughs> yeah, it was nice. I mean, we, yeah, like you said, we so rarely get to to see the flip side of that mm-hmm. of like the. I mean, six. we don't. We get enough of them <laughs> drooling over women. We rarely see women drooling over attractive men. Right. We also um, they had the another medic joke about. Cordelia being in the bikini from the mm-hmm. commercial. Which I'm back. glad they addressed because it, I mean, I don't have a really a problem with it because Cordelia, I mean, it's not like a completely exploitative thing. It kind of is, but she seems to enjoy wearing it. Uh-huh. So it doesn't, like, I could see how a woman would enjoy wearing that, especially Cordelia, who likes, who likes to be attractive. Right. As opposed to the bikini, which... It really covered up nothing more, but seems somehow much more disgusting. But she has like a, a cape. <laughs> she has a cape she can play with. And jewels. Yeah. <laughs> it's a tiara. It sells the whole thing. It's just the fact that she enjoys wearing it, obviously. Right. All right. Is there anything else you want to talk about in the episode besides our favorite moment? I will save more for the favorite moment. Okay. So first up in feedback, we have Kanem. And he says, thoughts on Through the Looking Glass. One, is it possible the Grusalog was created with no previous knowledge of Gru the Wanderer? Two, okay, so now that we've seen the pure demon side of Angel, does this do anything to your takes on what exactly Angelus is? Since this demon thing seems pretty personality-less, where do you think a vampire's personality comes from? Is it something inherent 
but mostly unseen in the human version? I know it's open to interpretation, but what do you guys think? And did this episode change your take? Three, taken individually, the first three parts of this are okay, but considered as one story, the tone is all over the place. That's a problem. And he gave it a 65 out of 100. So thank you, Kanan. So what, what does it change? It doesn't really change my opinion, because I've always said that the demon... It's so the de- de- vampires are humans and demons. I think the demon inside an- angel is particularly strong, and I do think I don't think that's a I don't know because I don't think that's just because vampires all vampires have personality, right? Well, some more than others, but yeah. Well, that's, that's it depends the on how quickly Buffy is going to kill them. <laughs> that's right. How like quick, how much personality they have. The important ones have more of a personality. So do you, I guess what he's going to, does this seem to suggest that Angelus' personality comes from Liam? Because the demon, or, the or purest form of the demon humanity. doesn't have any kind of traits. It doesn't necessarily change my take on him. Because now I'm actually going to, I think I might actually change my opinion, not change my opinion, but modify it slightly. Because we know Liam, we don't, I mean, honestly, don't know anything about Liam. We know that the only thing we really know about Liam was he was very lusty. Right. And had a lot of vices. So this demon is very violent. So I'm thinking when you combine that with Liam's lust, it just becomes a lust for violence and power, which is what Angelus basically is. Like, Angelus just likes his destruction. So you combine Liam's addictive personality with this demon, which is pure kill, purely wants to kill things and doesn't care. And that's where the mix of the two becomes Angelus and then Angel. Angel always has... Angel has always said that he wants... Deep down, he wants to be like... Not wants to be like Angelus, but he always has his urges. And he has to suppress them. Right, but obviously like this pure demon thing comes across as just this animal mm-hmm. that just wants to kill everything. But at the same time, I mean, we see it go up to Fred and not kill her and just kind of run away. So is that just like a little bit of angel underneath? Is Is it just that it's this world's physiology that he just becomes this kind of animal thing. Because I don't know if that... Like, the yes, they have Wesley say, like, that's Angel in his purest demon form. Well, they ha- they say, gun ass, that's the thing that's... I don't know. Inside him the whole time, yeah. or whatever. And Wesley says in his purest form, yes. It's interesting. I think it puts an interesting wrinkle on it. And it puts in more questions and doubt of what exactly is a vampire and exactly how, how it reacts when you turn a human. Mm-hmm. So is it more that the hu- like the vampire's personality comes completely from the person's humanity? Like the fact that they seem very driven about who they were as a human, like informs what kind of vampire they are. I don't know. I think it, I think it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's necessarily that it just gets this demon kind of rage monster underneath it. Like, he just, he hulks out in the episode. I I don't think that's what Angelus is, though. Because Angelus seems like it's his humanity without the conscience. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is Yeah. Is that Liam, the only thing we know about Liam is he liked to drink a lot, he liked to have sex a lot, he liked to do, he liked, he had a lot of vices and he liked to do them. And the demon just wants to kill things. So when you combine that addiction personality, addictive personality with just a desire to kill things, you get Angelus who just revels in all kinds of destruction. Right. That's what I'm saying. I don't think, and I think, I think there's three distinct personalities. There's Liam, and then Angelus is him. Liam mixed with this demon. And then there's Angel, who doesn't seem like either one of them, but still has the desires of Angelus. And if he didn't have a conscience, because Angel has said that he he when he had those nightmares, he enjoyed it. He still enjoys it. The problem is he 
feels he he feels guilty about enjoying it. Right, he has his conscience yes. back. He has a or soul. soul. Yeah. So I I think it it's some weird combination of the two. Like obviously this demon kind of like infects them and it gives them these urges. But I don't I, I don't think that that what we saw in this episode is like the purest form of Angelus. It might be No, I don't think it's the purest form of Angelus. I think it's the purest, it's the purest form of, of the vampire yeah, that's in him. The vampire yeah. demon that's in him. Okay, the other two questions. One. <laughs> so I didn't know who Guru the Wonder is and I looked it up and it looks a lot like Guru. Right. So I think it's very I would be shocked if it, there isn't a connection. Yeah, I think I think they did that really on purpose. Three, I think Belonging was supposed to... I mean, Belonging is not the funniest episode, but there's moments. It's a pretty dramatic episode. I think I feel more negative about Over the Rainbow after watching this, because I think it's supposed to transition you from Belonging to this... And then the end of the episode go, gets dramatic again. I don't. I think they're all belo- uh, over the rainbow is trying to do what this episode is. I don't think it does it well. I don't think they have different tones. I think they have different levels of success in achieving their tone. Right. Actually, if you cut over the rainbow out, mm-hmm. and honestly, what did we lose? <laughs> I would actually like this art pretty well. It would just be. Like, give me, like, five minutes from Over the Rainbow where they finally, like, get the book drive so, into the world. guess what? Cut out the beginning of this episode, which is <laughs> really clunky, <laughs> and just make that Over the Rainbow in five seconds. We're done. Of course, that requires right. that Gunn be with them and, you know, doesn't have this whole thing about guilt about during his crew, which he doesn't really have anyway. When has he right. mentioned that guy that died in The Longing since? And it's only been a couple of days. Right. Well, I mean, he has the one line about, I left my... And that's a pretty little... jokey line. <laughs> right. Well, most of this episode is pretty jokey. Um, minus, you know, some of the dark stuff towards the end, but... I think they mix it throughout I... when you go back to Fred, but anyway, we talked about right. it. The, ba- the, the balance of this episode works so much better than last week's. And if you would just cut last week's episode out of this arc... Minus the exposition that we need, which they just wrap up at the beginning of this episode, mm-hmm. like it works a lot better. I actually belonging had its issues, but it still works. It was kind well, of belo- the a little worst problem with belonging is it just felt so incomplete. Right, it felt like the part one, and it, it, I still think belonging was the best version of what it was trying to be. It's just the best version. The, what it's trying to be is not a satisfying episode. So. I don't know. I this episode has kind of gotten it back on track, mm-hmm. especially like going towards the finale. Okay. So next up, we have Alicia who said favorite scenes. You're most high if you think that's going to happen. Cordelia opening her arms, hug the guys, and them running past to get the food. Lauren's reaction to Cordelia says angels reflecting. Angel talking about his hair. Come on, gorgeous, you can sell yourself in my grandmother's glass eye. Ming Lord's family, Numfar dancing. I chopped off the evil Laura's hand and he screamed and screamed and then I left. Lauren singing stop in the name of love. Your booty, hey. Not that booty. Oh. Corey's fine, they made her princess. Cordelia parting Lauren, then Lauren Cordelia's conversation about the Grus Lug. Other Grus Lug, not a big fan. And then she said, Oh my god, Lauren, I'm assuming that is refers to his separate head. Oh, okay. Oh I'm just going to assume. Or she's just is really happy about Lauren for some reason. It's a shocking ending. I still don't think he's dead. <laughs> but I guess it's shocking on first watch, maybe. Right. I did like uh, Lauren singing and everyone's like pain. Mm-hmm. Uh, his mom going, it burns, it burns. Well, I like What I like about that is because I thought it was going to come down harder than that, but then the other thing is because when they get they get trapped in the beginning of the, uh, at the end of the last episode and they don't know what to do if Lauren just sung they wouldn't have gotten captured at all. But I think he just decides he says stop, 
And then he just goes into the song because that's just his natural instinct. And then he realizes it's working and then he gets really <laughs> caught up in the performance. Right. He's like trying to distract them. And then it's like, oh, everyone's actually like doled over in pain. Mm-hmm. Yeah, keep going. Um, that worked. Yeah. So, so would you ever characterize Cordelia and Lorne to be very close? Because in this episode, whenever no, he's like I don't... tied up. And she like runs up to him saying, "Oh, baby!" Like, well, that felt a little weird to me. It feels weird that she calls him baby because she doesn't. I don't think she's ever called anybody else baby. <laughs> um, but what you're, I do think that she would be affectionate with him, like that. Her saying, "Oh, baby," and <laughs> her saying, "Oh, baby," and untying him, which just sounds weird out of context, but. That is more Cordelia to me than when she's about to let them all die as a joke or say right. off with their heads. Like she says, oh, baby, oh, baby feels a little bit like a manipulation because you have to she has to be overly affectionate with him so that Gru can respond to that later. But I don't the fact that she is nice to him, I don't feel out of character. She may be a little bit more f- so we may be seeing more friendliness than would be yeah, expected, but I don't they think They have it's... this, like, or, well, right after that, also, they share this moment that they seem a lot closer than they ever well, have been. Him being like, oh, you're having a good time. You can, well, I can I've... call them back and you can keep the handcuffs or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't think that's out of character. The, Lauren just comes off buddy-buddy with everybody. Right. And I think it's not like she's going to have that conversation about how good-looking Gru is with Angel, Wesley, or Gunn. No, I mean, I guess that's true. Because, I, I mean, Lorne brings it up, and she she responds to that. Okay. Because it's Lorne who says that he's very attractive and looks like you don't need interrupting, and she's like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just goes from there. I mean, I agree with you that Oh Baby seems a little bit more friendly than those two actually are. Right. But when they're talking about Gru being pretty, I don't think that's out of the realm of believability. Possibility, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, so now we're going to get to favorite moments. So why don't you go first? Okay. For me, I went with uh, the end of the episode. Basically, once Cordelia gets her groove back and, and actually starts standing up for herself. I thought it worked really nicely to, to get her back to her being her old self, basically, or her, her good, her best self and her, you know, saying that she's going to change things around here and do the right thing. I thought it worked really well. And in that scene, I mean, we get the most threatening the covenant have ever been. Um, and it works well at making them appear as the, the, the ending bad guys for the finale mm-hmm. going forward. So I went with when Angel first transforms back and then he just starts like having a seizure. And the it's not a silent scene because the music is pretty present throughout, but it's a wordless scene. And then, so what the moment I like the most is when Fred goes over to comfort him. And I really like the visual of her leaning over him with the uh, bloody hand and she can't do it, which it's a, well, number one, I think it's another great job by David Boreanaz acting wise that he's able, I'm not a huge fan of the next scene where he talks about how they've seen when he's talking about Wesley and gun, how they've seen him and he can never go back. Right. Which I'm kind of okay with because that's more angel I mean, why I'm not okay with it is it's pretty on the nose, but it's also, we know that's actually not what Wesley and Gunn think. That's more Angel projecting his feelings onto them. Right. I mean, the the future scene, or that that scene worked better, mainly because of of, uh, Fred's character. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great job by him, but like what you just said, I think it worked. It's a better scene for Fred because she goes over to comfort him and she can't actually bring herself to have human contact. 
or vampire right. contact, <laughs> as it were. She, yeah. There's still this sweetness with her, but it also shows how damaged she is. And I think that's what I... It's emblematic of what I really like about this episode, and what I really like about this episode is Fred. Right. I I, I agree with you 100%. Like, uh, her... Like, she's had no interaction with anyone, so of course she would just gravitate more towards Angel and, and the the need that she has. Can't that man just has me from the monsters. Just to have, have human contact. And we haven't really talked about it. I mean, the fact that Angel turns into a demon and this whole thing about who is Angel has been the whole thing. Again, not very subtle, but it also really works to end... It, it works as well as Cordelia. I mean, it's as equally unsubtle as Cordelia's visions being a curse, and then she becomes a princess as Angel getting transformed into the purest form of evil in this demon form. Right. But they both but, work on a same thematic level, and I think they're both. Even if they're not subtle, I don't think they're. I don't. I could never say that they're not well done, because subtlety doesn't yeah. necessarily equate with quality. That's true, and some of that just comes from the fact that we are in this kind of fantasy realm, that everything is is more exaggerated, yeah. which didn't work last week, but they, again, found found more balance this week, I think. Okay. So, scores? Yes. So, because you hate fun, <laughs> I'm going to go first. Okay. And I ended up giving this a 76 because I... I, I don't think it's the best episode of the season. I don't think I think there's a lot of flaws. Like I said, I don't like, I don't dislike, but I don't necessarily like Wesley and Gunn the story. And I think there's some clunkiness in the beginning. But I do think that this is the episode I've enjoyed the most in a while. I think I this sets, even though I don't think this is a straight up comedy ep- episode. I think this sets up the balancing. Of comedy, I think there's more comedy in here than there's drama. I think it sets a new gold standard that I think Sense and Sensitivity set in season one. I don't think they've been able to replicate till now. And I gave Sense some Sense and Sensitivity a seventy, so I went a little bit higher. Huh. Um. I mean, yeah. The, okay. So I ended up giving this a sixty-nine out of one hundred because you hate fun. Because I hate fun, apparently. No, I. I think the clunkiness just hit me in um, in more ways than it did with you. And one of the dramatic scenes towards the end, I felt was a little over the top with Fred uh, holding up the, the bloody hand and the Braveheart music playing. But they did have a lot of great moments here. I mean, with the comedy with and with Fred. I, I thought this was a really good Fred episode. Like, there was a lot of intrigue with her character, and I want to know more about her. Uh, I, I don't, I just, I didn't have the, I mean, it wasn't like the funniest episode I've ever seen in the, in the, in the series so far for me. What would it had some really better? great, I'm just curious. <clears throat> um, the fact that you can't think of one means that the one doesn't exist. <laughs> to say, I mean, continue with your wrong opinions. Well, no, I mean, I think the, Numfar dancing is one of the the moments that you'll look back on the series and think about. I think that was a very funny moment, but I don't think this episode is like I didn't find myself like overly doled over laughing. I mean, I had I enjoyed the episode. I had a lot of fun with it, but I I no, I'm not I don't think I'm going to look back and think that this was the funniest episode of Angel. That's fair. I don't agree with you. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Because you hate fun, but all right, let's do the podcast. <laughs> all right. And if you'd like to leave us some feedback, you can do so by commenting on the post at the angel rewatch dot wordpress dot com. Or you can send an email to angel rewatch at gmail dot com. Or you can call our voicemail number at two oh six two oh three three two seven six. Or you can go to the Tom and Rich's Angel Rewatch dot com dot com to see all the gifts of whatever episode we're watching and the reviews are archived there as well. We're available on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. While you're there, leave us a five-star review. It really helps promote the show. You can follow me on Twitter, at NerdGuyWilliam. And you can follow me on Twitter and Tumblr, at the Comforador. And next time, we'll be reviewing There's No Place Like Plurtzglurb, where, aided by Fred, Angel struggles to suppress his inner demon. 
Okay, so I just want to say, because it's been bugging me, they better not do another alternate reality episode because I feel like they've run out of all the possible names they can do. We've had two Wizard of Oz references, one Alice in Wonderland's reference. It belongs just the odd man now. I don't know what's going on there. But <laughs> three of these are the three most common alternate reality episode titles that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> 